so for this one, we have uh, a kind of unusual situation. We've got just the kinetic energy graph and not the potential energy graph. It does say it's a Leonard Jones potential though. So presumably that is the usual Leonard Jones potential energy graph. And we have the kinetic energy curve and we wanna know how much energy do we need to add to the system so that it's unbounded. Uh, what would you expect an unbounded system to look like? It might actually help here if we drew in the potential energy curve. Uh, what is the what are some characteristics of the usual Leonard Jones potential energy curve if we wanted to actually draw that in here? Like what can you tell me about the general shape or the yeah, the lowest uh, e bond is goes all the way down to negative one, right? Negative one epsilon. So we should have e bond be negative one epsilon. Uh, specifically at what, um, what location, what R value, what location is going to have that lowest possible. Yeah, 1.12 sigma should work. That's our, uh, I think that's just right about here. So that is our lowest bond energy, or lo lowest potential energy, I mean. And that corresponds to the high, the location with the highest kinetic energy. And we could draw in the rest of it also. We should expect it's gonna be approaching an asymptote of zero here, and then going up steeply, not a very good graph of it, but general idea. Um, but all I think all we really need to do is compare the one point where we, we really have a known information. Specifically, if we take a look at the location equilibrium, 1.12 sigma. At that location, what's potential energy? Yeah. The uh, potential energy equals negative one epsilon. And what's the kinetic energy at that location? Yeah, positive 0.8 epsilon. And so we can add those to get a total energy equal to how much? <clears throat> if you just add those, what do you get? Negative one plus positive 0.8 would be how much? Yeah, negative 0.2 epsilon. So that's the total energy. And we can actually draw this on the graph if you want. We can just put a mark at negative 0.2 epsilon. That's E total. And note that this matches up with the idea of R min and R max, the, the locations where kinetic energy is zero being at the locations where E total matches potential energy. Also to break the bond, if we want this system to be unbonded, what would E total have to be for this to be unbonded? Because right now it's definitely bonded based on this E total. How high does E total have to be raised? Uh, critical points, do you mean the, the max and min? Uh, well, the max potential energy is always, potential energy in the Leonard Jones case is always going to have a minimum in R naught, which is 1.12 sigma. And kinetic energy has a maximum at that same R naught, that same location. If you're looking for where kinetic energy hits zero, kinetic energy is gonna hit zero wherever E total meets potential energy. Because at the location where those are equal, potential energy and E total, there's nothing left for kinetic energy. Because we know that kinetic energy plus potential energy equals E total. If potential energy is the same as E total, then kinetic energy has to be zero. So those are important things to look for on a graph like this. And at any R value, any location, where potential energy is the same as E total, you know that at that location, kinetic energy has to be zero. So that's usually a good way to find the R max and R min, the locations where the object stops moving and turns around. 
Uh, but in this case, yeah, for the Leonard Jones potential energy to break the bond, you have to raise E total up to zero or higher. It's currently at negative 0.2, so we just have to add plus 0.2 epsilon to break the bond. So I think that's all we would need to do here. To break the bond, add delta E equals plus 0.2 epsilon to bring E total up to zero. That would break the bond. Any questions on that one so far? <clears throat> and let's take a look at the next one. Uh, is this one visible? Can you see this one all right? Wait, what about now? Okay. So here we've got uh, four molecules and some rather unusual side lengths. They're four identical molecules, so we don't worry. We don't have to worry about different epsilon values and stuff like that. They're all the same epsilon. Let me go grab an epsilon I can copy paste. One moment. Epsilon. There it is. I'll put this here for future reference. Okay, so we want to look into what are we actually trying to find here? <laughs> Looks like we have, we're just removing A, right? So this isn't really asking what's the total bond energy of the whole system or how much energy would it take to vaporize the whole thing. We just want to remove molecule A from the system. We want to take molecule A and move it very far away which really means we just need to break bonds that A is connected to. And if we take a look at it in, in, that, in that context, just removing A, but not moving B, C, or D at all, uh, what bonds are we breaking? Yeah, we wanna break every bond A is connected to. So we wanna break the A, B bond and we also want to break the AC bond and we want to break the AD bond. And of course there are other bonds in the system like CD, BD, and BC, but we only have to care about breaking the bonds that A is connected to if all we want to do is remove A. So we really just need to consider these three bonds and we just need to find the energy it takes to break each one of those. I think the simplest one of those uh, is gonna be the AB bond because that's equilibrium distance. So how much energy does it take to break an equilibrium distance bond? Yeah, for that one, we just have to add one epsilon. So to break this bond costs one epsilon. The value of the bond is negative one epsilon but breaking it requires adding plus one epsilon to bring it up to zero. So we're gonna to need to add one epsilon to break this bond. And what about from A to C? The distance from A to C is a little bit longer. It's square root of two times R naught. And we know that the amount of energy to break that would be what? Yeah, it tells us here that, the, that a bond with length root two times R naught has a value of negative 0.11 epsilon. And presumably you could get that from the Leonard Jones potential energy formula or the Leonard Jones potential energy graph. But in this case, it's just given by the chart. So if its energy is negative 0.11 epsilon, we'd have to add 0.11 epsilon in order to break the bond. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. The energy a bond has is a negative value, but you'd have to add a positive amount to bring it up to zero in order to break the bond. And then for this third one from A to D, that's on a diagonal, so we're gonna to have to actually find that length. And how would you calculate this distance? 
if we already know this distance, yeah, we can use a Pythagorean theorem, right? We already know two of the side lengths. Um, so we can say that side squared or leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So R naught squared from the short leg plus R naught root two squared from the longer leg equals the hypotenuse squared. And if we combine those together, we've got R naught squared plus R naught squared times root two squared would just be two R naught squared. Combine those together, what do we get? Yeah, three times R naught squared equals that hypotenuse squared. And then we can take the square root of both sides. Square root of the whole thing, square root of this whole thing. So the hypotenuse should equal square root of three times square root of R naught squared, which is just R naught. So that's the length of this hypotenuse. This diagonal here is R naught times root three. And we can look that up on the table. That bond has an energy of negative 0.036 epsilon. So we'd have to add positive 0.036 epsilon to break the bond. So the distance is root three times R naught. The energy we'd have to add is 0.036 epsilon. Any questions on those bonds so far? And then what we actually wanna do is break all the bonds, at least all the bonds connected to A. How much energy, we, or how would we figure out how much energy we'd have to add? Yeah, we can just add these together because you have to add one epsilon to break this short bond. You'd have to add another 0.11 epsilon to break this medium bond. And you'd have to add another 0.036 epsilon to break this longer diagonal bond. Add all those up and that gives us 1.146 epsilon. So that's the energy you'd have to add to break all the bonds connected to A and move A far away from the system. Any other questions on that so far? I have a question about this problem. Mm -hmm. um, so if, or I have like two follow-up questions. Um, the first one is if A, B, C, and D were all different molecules, how would that change the calculations? Uh, if they were different molecules, then each pairing would have a different value of epsilon. Like if, 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 if they were different molecules, there would be a, a value of epsilon for the AB bond, a different value of epsilon for the AC bond, a different value for the AD bond. So they would all be different epsilon values. The fact that these are all the same type of molecule means we only need one value for epsilon. All that's changing is the distance between the particles. Okay, so the epsilon associated with the R naught value would just change? Uh, the R naught would also be different. Yeah, for instance, R, I mean, R naught is generally 1.12 sigma if all the atoms are the same type, because sigma is just the diameter of that molecule. So different types of molecules have different sigmas. Um, but if you're talking about a mixed pair of molecules, like let's say you've got a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom, for instance, they're different sizes. So I think what you'd use there is 1.12 times the average sigma, the average diameter. So add the diameters together, divide by two. That's your new effective sigma. And then multiply that by 1.12. Okay. And I think that might vary from molecule to molecule, but I think that using the average diameter as the effective sigma should at least be a very good approximation. Uh, as for um, why it's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry. No, you go ahead. Oh, there was another question in chat of why the potential energy is negative. The idea is that you, if you have a pair of atoms that's, or a pair of molecules or whatever that's bonded, like let's say you've got, let me uh, move this aside for the moment. And 
if you have a pair of molecules that's bonded, like let's say you just got these two molecules or two atoms or whatever that are bonded together. They're 1.12 sigma apart. <clears throat> and let's say this is initial, this is B4. And then we apply some energy to pull the molecules far apart. Particles unbonded and far apart. So we're talking about the exact same two molecules, but they're now far apart from each other. <coughs> and in that case, we now have, uh, we've added energy to make that happen. Specifically, if we make them very far apart, how much energy do you have to add to make that happen, to break one bond? Or what do we call the amount of energy required to break the bond? Yeah, that's epsilon. Specifically plus one epsilon. So breaking the bond requires adding plus one epsilon to the system. And the change in energy is really what's important, but it's useful to be able to describe how much energy there is in each case as well. And the usual convention is if the particles are unbonded, we want to say the energy is zero. So in the, in the unbonded system, we would say E bond is zero because there's no bonds anymore. But let's backtrack. If you started at some value and you added plus one epsilon to bring the energy up to zero, what was the energy before you added that plus one epsilon? Yeah, it's got to be less than zero. Specifically, how much less than zero? Right, that's got to be negative one epsilon. So the convention here is that if particles are unbonded, that is in a gaseous form, vapor form, then we say the bond energy is zero because there aren't any bonds. But to get there from the bonded form, you'd have to add plus one epsilon. If you have to add plus one epsilon to get up to zero, that means before you added plus one epsilon, your energy was negative one epsilon. So a single bond between a pair of particles has a value of negative epsilon. Breaking the bond requires adding energy to cancel that out, as opposed to forming the bond would require removing energy. If you want to allow these particles to come together and form a bond with each other, you've got to remove one epsilon worth of energy so that the new energy is negative one epsilon. And this, this often seems a little counterintuitive because you have to remove energy to create a bond, you have to add energy to remove a bond, but it's all because a bond has a negative amount of energy. Each bond, each uh, nearest neighbor bond anyway, has an energy of negative one epsilon. To break the bond, you add plus one epsilon to cancel it out. To form a bond, you remove one epsilon, so you introduce a negative one epsilon, allowing a bond to form. Any questions on that so far? All right, then let's, just for some more practice, let's try uh, looking at what would happen if we did wanna break all the bonds in the system. Because this problem was this this particular problem was just asking how much energy does it take to remove A from the system. But let's see if we can establish all the bonds in the whole system. For example, we were just looking at the bonds connecting from A to other things, but there's other bonds as well. And we want to categorize these based on type, like the, the size of the dis distance of the bond. For instance, we've got this bond from A to B, which was the distance of R naught. Are there any other bonds of that same length? Yeah, C to D is another bond of that length. So we've got two copies of that bond. So we've got two of these bonds for a total value. If we wanna look at the bond energy, that'd be two times negative epsilon. In other words, negative two epsilon. So those two bonds together have a bond energy of negative two epsilon. Uh, 
breaking those bonds would require adding plus two epsilon, but the energy right now in the bonded form is negative two epsilon. Uh, likewise, the R naught root two, the distance from A to C, are there any, there are any other bonds of that distance? Yeah, from B to D. And it looks like those are the only two of that type. So we would say there are two bonds of that type, the R naught root two distance, two of these bonds. So we've got two times, and each one of those bonds has an energy of negative 0.11 epsilon. Multiply those together, we get negative 0.22 epsilon. And what about this diagonal? Are there any other diagonals just like that one? We've got A to D. Are there any other diagonals of that length? Yeah, B to C is that same length. So we've got two copies of that diagonal, two of these bonds, two times, and each one of those has a value of negative 0.036 epsilon. So multiply those together, we get negative 0 0.072 epsilon. So that would be the energy of both of those diagonal bonds together. And I think that should be all the bonds. There's actually a very useful technique from combinatorics for checking if you have all the bonds, if you're not sure whether you've really got all of them or not. Uh, this is essentially what we often call a handshake problem in the sense that you've got, if you imagine these are four people and you wanna know how many possible handshakes are there, assuming a handshake involves a pair of two people. Uh, so if you wanted to calculate that, you could say, a, like if you look at molecule A, A could shake hands with how many other molecules? Yeah, there's three other molecules that A could shake hands with. Likewise, C could shake hands with three other molecules. D could shake hands with the other three molecules. B could shake hands with the other three molecules. So for a handshake problem like this, you'd wanna say something like uh, there are four molecules in the system we multiply that by three possible handshakes per molecule. And what would we end up with? 12. Did we count 12 different bonds? Looks like we've only got six so far, right? Does that mean we didn't actually count all of them? Yeah, we counted these twice. It's definitely true that we have four molecules and it's true that there are three possible handshakes per molecule. But that's saying that for instance, A can shake hands with C, D and B. And also saying C can shake hands with D, B and A. But we already counted the handshake from A to C. We don't need to count it again from C to A. So this approach saying that each molecule has three handshakes, three possible bonds is counting each bond twice. So we need to divide that by two to eliminate that double counting. So we really only have six bonds and we've counted six, two of the uh, vertical short bonds, two of the medium horizontal bonds and two of the long diagonal bonds. So it looks like we really have counted all six of the possible bonds. So this can be a very useful way of checking have you really counted all the possible bonds in the system in terms of thinking of it as a handshake problem. And now that we're sure we've got all the bonds, we can just add those all up. The total bond energy of this system is negative two epsilon plus negative 0.22 epsilon plus negative 0.072 epsilon. So negative 2.294 epsilon. That would be the bond energy of this entire cluster, which means if you wanted to scatter the four molecules all far apart from each other and vaporize the whole thing, you'd have to add plus 2.294 epsilon to bring the total up to zero. But in this context, in this situation, we would say this cluster of molecules has a bond energy of negative 2.294 epsilon. And epsilon itself would presumably be some tiny amount of energy, like something times 10 to the negative 21 joules or something like that. But for this context, we can just leave it in terms of epsilon. Uh, using the formula for 
yeah, the bond counting thing. That's generally more if you have a much larger cluster. Like in this case, with only four molecules, we were able to just count up the bonds by hand. We could actually draw in those six bonds and account for all of them individually. Uh, but if you're dealing with a much larger cluster of molecules, then that's not really going to work. For example, let's say instead of just dealing with uh, four molecules, let's say we were dealing with a, let's say a, a, a square grid that's much, much larger. Let's say, let me zoom out a bit here. I want to keep the information from the potential energy column because that's going to be useful. But let's say we were dealing with a much larger cluster. Let's say we had, uh, and let's say it's, let, let's assume it's still a square grid. So we've got these molecules, these should be R naught apart from each other, equilibrium distance. So let's say we've got a square grid And let's assume these are all equilibrium distance from each other as possible. So we're not going to have all these like R naught root two. They're just all R naught from their neighbors. That should be enough. Let me tidy that up a little bit. So let's say we've got this uh, square grid and not just these 12 atoms, but let's assume this keeps going on for a very long way in all directions. So we've got more molecules up here, more molecules over here. Make those easier to see. So we've got more molecules in all directions. It's not just these 12. In fact, let's say we've got like three moles of these. moles of these molecules in a square grid. And we want to know the total bond energy. And in order to figure that out, uh, it's often useful to just take a look at one sample molecule. Like let's say we just look at uh, let's say this as an example. If we want to take a look at this example molecule, we should, we should investigate things like how many bonds is it attached to? And let's start with just those uh, nearest neighbor bonds, the ones that are R not apart from each other. How many nearest neighbors does this molecule have that are exactly R not apart from it? Yeah, it looks like we've got four nearest neighbors. There's one above, one below, one to the left, one to the right. And it looks like that's going to be true of any such molecule. For instance, this molecule has one above, one to the left, one below, one to the right. But notice that even in doing that, just marking off the four nearest neighbors for that molecule as well, we can see that we counted one of those bonds twice. And as we progress, if we say like this molecule has one above, one to the left, one below, one to the right, we're eventually going to be marking every bond twice. So this approach is going to be double counting, which means we will need to be dividing by two if we use this approach. But to figure out the total number of bonds of that type, we would say each one of those bonds, if so for the nearest neighbors, we have four bonds of this type per molecule. How many molecules are we dealing with here in total? If we've got three moles, how many molecules is that? Yeah, three times Avogadro's number. So three times Avogadro's number is the number of molecules in the system. So we're still in much in the same way we were dealing with with the handshakes problem. We have number of molecules in the system, that's three Na, times number of bonds per molecule. But we're not looking at all the bonds in the whole system. We're just looking at only the nearest neighbor bonds for now, because we got to categorize this. So four nearest neighbor bonds per molecule times number of molecules in the system 
that would tell us the total number of bonds except that double counts. If we say each molecule has four bonds, this one is bonded to its neighbor, its neighbor is also bonded to the original. That's counting that bond twice. So we do need to divide by two here. Actually, let me put that all in one now because I'm getting more space here. So this so far tells us the total number of bonds of that type, the total number of nearest neighbor bonds in the whole system. Four times three over two times Na, that will be six times Avogadro's number. And note that that's a huge number of bonds. Six times Avogadro's number is enormous because there's lots and lots of bonds. Although strictly speaking, this is actually an overestimate. There's not really gonna be six Avogadro's number of bonds in this system because not every molecule in the system acts like this one. What molecules would you expect to have fewer than four nearest neighbors in this cluster? Well, still focusing on the nearest neighbors. This molecule has four nearest neighbors. This molecule has four nearest neighbors. This molecule has four nearest neighbors. Are there any molecules in this sample that you would expect to have less than four nearest neighbors? Does this sample go on forever in all directions? It goes on for a very long way, but not forever. We're not talking about infinitely many molecules. We're talking about three moles of molecules. Yeah, somewhere we're gonna reach the end of the sample, right? If we take a look all the way at the edge, so somewhere down here, we get to an edge. So maybe something like this. A little sloppy, but it'll work. If we start taking a look at nearest neighbors, like this one has four nearest neighbors. But if we take a look at the one on the edge, it's got a nearest neighbor above, a nearest neighbor below, a nearest neighbor to the left, but it does not have a nearest neighbor to the right because that's the edge. There are no more molecules beyond that one. So some, any molecule on the edge is gonna have only three nearest neighbors, not four. And in the corners, it's even worse. The corner only has two nearest neighbors. So we can't honestly say every molecule has four nearest neighbor bonds per molecule. The ones on the edge only have three, the ones on the corner only have two. So the average number of bonds per molecule is gonna be less than four. However, if you've got this enormous sample, how many of the molecules are on the edge versus how many are on the interior? Where would you expect most of the molecules to be? Yeah, most of them are on the interior. In fact, if you're dealing with a large enough sample, you can say that effectively all of them are on the interior. There are some on the edge, but the ones on the edge are such a small fraction of the total number, we can largely ignore it. So 6Na is gonna be a, a slight overestimate of the number of bonds, but not very much of an overestimate. We can pretty much ignore the edge cases if we're talking about a large enough sample. So let's say six times Avogadro's number. That's the total number of nearest neighbor bonds. And how much energy does each one of those bonds have? What's the energy of one nearest neighbor bond? Yeah, epsilon. Or since it's bonded, we call that negative epsilon. So we multiply that together. We've got the number of bonds of this type times the energy of each one of those bonds. That's really all this is doing. Negative one epsilon is the energy of one nearest neighbor bond. So we're multiplying that by the number of bonds of that type in the whole system. And that should tell us the energy of all those bonds of that type. So negative one epsilon times, this worked out to six Na. So we get negative six times Na times epsilon. So that would be the energy of all of the nearest neighbor bonds in the entire system. And you could use, if you have a value for epsilon, presumably something times 10 to the negative 21st joules, you could fill that in and then fill in six times 10 to the 23rd for Avogadro's number and then multiply by negative six. And that would tell you the bond energy if you're only considering the nearest neighbor bonds. And that's a pretty good estimate. The other bonds are gonna contribute some energy, but not as much. 
So this is going to be a pretty good estimate for the bond energy of the whole system. Any questions on that so far? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, so if we wanted a more accurate representation of the bond energy, then would we then calculate like the next nearest neighbors and then the next mm -hmm. next nearest neighbors and then just yeah. add all that together? Right. Okay. In fact, let's go ahead and try that. Because uh, the second nearest neighbors, for example, let's say we're talking about from this same central molecule. Uh, how many second nearest neighbors does it have? Or, or which ones would be the second nearest neighbors? Like if we wanted a bond that was a little bit longer than this distance, which direction should we go? Yeah, if we take a look at the diagonals. So out to here, that diagonal is gonna be longer than those horizontals and verticals. So we've got one, two, three, four, of those diagonals for second nearest neighbors. So those second nearest neighbors again we've got four bonds of that type per molecule. We multiply bonds of that type per molecule times number of molecules which is still three times Avogadro's number. Uh, does this involve double counting? Like if we say this molecule also has uh, four bonds of this type. And this molecule up here also has four bonds of this type. Ah, looks like we just double counted, right? So by saying each molecule has four of these diagonal bonds, we are counting each bond twice. So that means we do need to divide by two again. So so we divide that by two. And also we need to multiply by the energy of one of those types of bonds. So what's the energy of one bond of that type, the second nearest neighbor? Actually, first of all, what's the distance? If we want to find this diagonal distance, we already know that the vertical and horizontal, those are just R naught, right? How would we find this distance though? That, and keep in mind, this is not the same as the diagonal distance from the original problem, because we're assuming that all these side lengths are equal here. If these side lengths are R naught and another copy of R naught, yeah, this is just going to be R naught times square root of two. You can use the Pythagorean theorem for that. So this distance will just be R naught times square root of two. And the chart tells us that the energy of one such bond is negative 0.11 epsilon. So that's the energy we'd use here, negative 0 0.11 epsilon. So that's the energy of one bond of that type. And then we can just multiply these together. We got four times three divided by two is six times negative 0.11 would be negative 0 0.66 times Avogadro's number times epsilon. So that would be the energy of all the bonds of that type, all these second nearest neighbor bonds. And if we add those together, negative 6.66 times Avogadro's number times epsilon, that will be a more accurate approximation. It's still not gonna be exact because we're not looking at all the bonds, but it's much closer to the actual value. And note that that didn't actually change the value very much. We started with negative six, we added an extra negative 0.66. That doesn't change the value all that much. We're just adding a little bit of extra accuracy. Any questions on those contributions so far? And then if we wanted even more accuracy, let's say we take this to a third nearest neighbor. If we wanted to write out the third nearest neighbors, we wanted to go a little bit further than those diagonals. 
So which direction could we go if we wanted to go a little bit further than the diagonal? What would be a little bit further than that? Could we go to R naught? Yeah, if we just go to R naught in the horizontal or vertical directions, that is further than the diagonal, but that's less far than, for instance, this diagonal. So this further diagonal would be maybe the fourth nearest neighbor, but for the third nearest neighbor, these should work fine. And it looks like we've got four of those also. You could go to the left uh, and skip one, to the right and skip one, up and skip one, and down and skip one. And of course, these aren't necessarily shown on the diagram, but we assume this, this uh, cluster goes far out in a long direction, in all, in all, a long ways in all directions. So it looks like there's four nearest neighbors, four of the third nearest neighbors per molecule. So we've got some energy times four bonds of this type per molecule. And of course, it won't always be four. It's just what, it, what we get for this arrangement. Uh, different arrangements, like if you had a hexagonal grid instead, you'd get different values for these. And then again, we have three times Avogadro's number of molecules divided by two because we are double counting. And as for energy, you mentioned that distance would be two R naught. And I think that was shown on the table, wasn't it? We had, uh, if the distance is two R naught, then the energy of that bond is negative 0.015 epsilon. So we can say the energy of one of those bonds is negative 0.015 epsilon. And again, that might be a value from a chart like this, or if you don't have a chart, you could use the Leonard Jones potential energy equation. Or if you have a copy of the usual Leonard Jones potential energy graph, you could just look it up on the graph. Either way, you get a value for energy that's associated with that distance of bond. And multiply that out. What is that gonna be? We've got the same six, six Na times negative 0.015. So we get negative, 0.09 times Avogadro's number times epsilon. And again, these, these contributions get smaller and smaller. If we were looking at like the fourth nearest neighbors, we'd have an even smaller tiny contribution of energy. So as you, you could get more and more accuracy by doing more and more work, but there's a diminishing returns thing here. If you're looking at the fourth nearest neighbors, you'd be doing that much work again for only a little tiny contribution to accuracy. So nearest neighbors gets you a rough approximation. Nearest and second neighbors gets you a pretty good approximation. Nearest, second nearest, and third nearest neighbors gets you a really close approximation. Anything beyond that, probably not really worth worrying about unless the problem specifically asks you for even more detail. But to get the actual E bond, what would we do with all of these? You would add them all together. Yeah, add all these together. Six plus 0.66 plus 0 0.09 would be 6.75, and we still have the negative, the times Avogadro's number, and the times epsilon. So that would be the bond energy of this entire three mole sample of molecules. At least a pretty good approximation looking at just nearest, second nearest, and third nearest bonds. And if you had a value for epsilon in terms of joules, you could fill that in and then fill in 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd for Avogadro's number, multiply by negative 6.75, and that tells you the bond energy of the whole thing. And then if you wanted to vaporize it, you'd have to add plus that amount as a positive. This also ties nicely into the idea of the enthalpy of melting or enthalpy of boiling. I guess in this case, we'd probably call it sublimation because we're going from a solid all the way to a gas. But the heat of the enthalpy of sublimation would just be the amount of energy it takes to, to vaporize the whole thing divided by the number of moles. So that value divided by three would tell you the molar heat of vaporization for this whole substance. Because the molar heat of vaporization is just the, the amount of energy it takes to vaporize the whole thing per mole. Any other questions on that? So it's like determining um, the distances for like the third nearest neighbor and second kind of arbitrary like as long as it's greater than the previous neighbor or is there like a set? Uh, I think it's really just a matter of how much accuracy you're looking for. I mean, you could just keep adding in more and more contributions from the fourth nearest neighbors, fifth nearest neighbors and so on. Uh, 
but it's really a balance of how much extra work do you want to do versus how much extra accuracy does it provide. And I, I would assume that on any given test problem, for instance, it would specify uh, how many nearest neighbor contributions it's looking for. If you just want a quick rough estimate, I would look for just nearest neighbors alone. Uh, for more accuracy, second nearest neighbors and maybe third nearest neighbors. Beyond that, I don't think it would really be enough of a contribution to worry about. Again, unless of the problem specifically asked for it. Okay. Because like, what if for the second nearest neighbor, we chose the distance of two R naught instead of? Mm, that uh, wouldn't actually diagonal. be the second nearest neighbor though. Because the, 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 the idea is the second nearest neighbor would be the next one, the next distance further out. The third, okay. we can't have the, the second nearest neighbor be longer than the third near, or se, sorry, the second nearest neighbor can't be further out than that. We want the very next distance out. I find it's often useful to think of this in terms of like a, a slowly expanding circle. Like if you've got a, a circle that's gradually expanding larger and larger outwards from the central atom, the first other atoms or molecules or whatever that it hits, in this case, these four, those four would be the nearest neighbors. And then the next ones it hits, if we imagine that same circle expanding larger, as this circle gets larger and larger, the very next ones, it, the very next molecules it hits are gonna be these four second nearest neighbors. And then as that molecule expands even larger, or as that, that circle, as that circle expands further and further outwards, the next molecules it actually hits would be the third nearest neighbors. That's these ones that are two spaces away in the horizontal and vertical directions. So if you're not sure which ones are the nearest or second nearest or third nearest, imagine this circle or in three dimensions, a sphere slowly expanding outwards from that central molecule it's that expanding circular sphere should hit several other molecules at once as it expands. Those would be the nearest neighbors. Expand it further, there's gonna be another collection of molecules it hits all at once. Those are the second nearest neighbors. Expand further, it's gonna hit the third nearest neighbors and so on. So imagine expanding that circular sphere outwards, each collection of molecules it, that the circle passes by all at once are a cluster of nearest neighbors or second nearest neighbors or third nearest neighbors or whatever. Okay. And then the radius of that circle would be the distance we're talking about. Any other questions on that? No, thank you. You're welcome. All right, I will see you next time. Okay, thank you. You're Bye. Welcome.